الروح تسري والملائك حولنا طاب المساء والقلب يسبح في بحار الشوق يحمله الرجاء اسال دموع العين عن سر البكاء وعن الامان والمعاني عن معنى الوفاء to show you what you made of. This is fitna. So Allah said we can use either way as a fitna. And we see in the stories of Dawood and Sulaiman, Allah gave them abundance of wealth and power. When you speak about Sulaiman, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the wind, and Allah gave the jinn as servants to Sulaiman so they can do what Sulaiman orders them to do. And then Allah said, وَعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُدَ شُكْرَى وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ And you should fulfill and you will fulfill the gratitude that you owe to me. And only few of my slaves actually fulfill the duty of, of showing gratitude or thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now we go to the second and immediately after both places we follow the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. Because he was tested with the opposite. He was tested with bala. He was tested with calamity. And a lot of times we actually relate a lot to Ayyub. You get sick, you relate to Ayyub. You lack some money, you relate to Ayyub. Family is touched with adversity, we relate to Ayyub. But very rarely, when we are in good shape, we relate to Zawud and Sulaiman. So that is why it is important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Dawood and Sulaiman first. Pay attention. And Allah instructed his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this ummah, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Do not stretch your eyes and look to what Allah has given other people. زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Enjoyment and ornament of this dunya. It is their test. That's their trial. So when you look at someone who has a, a lot of wealth, a lot of happiness, things are going really well, don't envy them. That's their test. That's what Allah said. لَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ don't, don't stretch your eyes to that. Look what Allah has given you. Be busy with your own test. If you are taking a test in college or school, do you worry what the other person is doing there or you need to worry about yourself and Allah said that's what you need to do with what Allah has given you in this dunya good or bad health or sickness adversity or prosperity be busy with yourself that's your test you need to pass don't worry about the others may Allah help the believers you know everyone pass their own test so Allah said وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ it's their test. That's, that's what Allah has chosen for them. And you don't know if that's good or bad. Wealth can be bad. Wealth can be bad for Qarun. Wealth was really terrible for Fir'aun. Power was, was the worst thing that, that that person could have had. Fir'aun on the day of judgment would have wished that he was the poorest of the poor and not have to do what he has done. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا يَطْغَىٰ أَنْ أَرَّآهُ اسْتَغْنَىٰ A human being can transgress and become a taghiya when he feels that he doesn't need anyone. Remember in Surah Al-Kahf when that person who was wealthy walked into his garden دَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ قَالَ مَا أَظُنُّ أَنْ تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدَىٰ وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمَىٰ He kid kufr because he felt that he is so powerful and so rich and that, is, that was his test. That was his problem. It was, not his, it was not a good thing for him. So that's how we should look at, at everything in life. وَنَبْلُوَكُمْ بِالْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ فِتْنَةٌ Everything good or bad is not but a test for you. And Allah said this whole existence is nothing but a test for us. خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا 
Allah created life and death, this whole thing that you see around you. It's nothing but a test to see who will do better. So let's see how Ayyub did. Let's see how Ayyub passed his test. So Allah said, Inna wajadnahu sabira, ni'ma al-abd. Ni'ma al-abd. This is coming from Allah. I mean, what an honor. Ni'ma al-abd. The best of servants he is. Innahu awab. This is the medal of honor that Ayyub deserved and it was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recorded in the book that will be recited to the day of judgment. The final revelation, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this Quran. Now, when we read into the story of Ayyub, like if you go to Tafsir al-Bayan for al-Tabari or uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir, all of the Ummahat al-Tafsir, the traditional books, the basic books of Tafsir, you will see a lot of details about who Ayyub was, what was his status of wealth and health and happiness, and then what happened to him. However, the majority of the scholars agree that most of the details are Israeliya, are taken from the books of the people of the book, are taken from the majority taken from the people of the book and the students of uh, some of the tabi'in. So we will go over that quickly, but just to understand that when Allah, again, the, the rule is, when Allah doesn't give you the intricate details of things, it's not that important for you. And when it is needed, Allah tells you exactly the, the motion and, and how people reacted. When we were studying the surah of Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah in certain positions will give you a very close details about the dream and exactly and all of this and how it was transmitted. You see, there's a lot of detail in that. And here the basic idea is affliction and tribulation that went on multiple levels until Allah tested his slave Ayyub into the core, into the heart, to see if the heart has faith in it, has firm belief or not. And we know Ayyub passed. But the test was a test in his health and body. It was a test of his wealth, and it was a test that afflicted his family. So, wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The test of Ayyub alayhi salam, we know from the, from the revelation, from the flow of these verses, that Ayyub enjoyed health and strength. And Ayyub enjoyed a large family, a supportive family. He had children. He had, he had what? Al-Malu wal Banuna Zinatul Hayatid Dunya. Allah said, Al-Malu wal Banun Zinatul Hayatid Dunya. Wealth and children are the ornamentation of this dunya. This is the, the essence of, of all prosperity whether you go to a tribal society or a civil society, it's the same. Money and power is the essence of all of that. And then the children. And children in, in a lot of traditional societies are money and power. The more children you have, the more power you have. And Ayyub had it all. He was a prophet, a progeny of a prophet, of prophets, he had nobility, He's, he was wealthy, so you can imagine his status in his people. Imagine, you know, so many people that are wealthy, they enjoy the respect just because of their wealth. And this is the fact of life. Wealthy people enjoy the respect of society. And they make statements according to their wealth. You know, wealthy people are famous people. For no other reason. And then you get powerful people and influential people that are also important people. And then you get righteous people and leaders of the society that are also influential and important people. And Ayyub was all of that combined. And then he had youth, and he had strength, and he had health. And then the affliction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts, and the test for him starts. Now how did it happen? You will read different ways of how it happened. One of them, one is mentioned in the tabari that a shaitan 
wanted to challenge Ayyub. And Allah gave shaitan a power to be able to destroy the wealth and the health and the family of Ayyub to test the iman of Ayyub alayhi salam. And there is a very long story about how it exactly happened in Al-Tabari. And just one uh, important uh, notice there that when you see uh, Haddathan Muhammad ibn Sahl al-Bukhari, he will say it is upon Muhammad ibn Sahl al-Bukhari. That's a different Bukhari from Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. Okay, so when you read that in, in Surah, in, uh, in the Tafsir al-Bayan for al-Tabari, just pay attention that that doesn't mean that this story is coming from Sahih al-Bukhari. It's not from there. Ayyub is mentioned in a couple of hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, but none of them about the details of how the affliction happened to Ayyub alayhi salam, Allahu alam. And if anybody finds out a different way, just let me know. Teaches me about that. The other uh, story that you see in there is Allah has afflicted Ayyub gradually by the loss of one thing after the other to, to test his patience and to test his endurance. First he lost his wealth. Then his family started leaving him or dying. There's no agreement of exactly what happened to them. And then his body finally was afflicted where he became so sick that he could not make a living. And his wife, his patient wife, has to actually work and support him. Now that by itself, for a man of the status and the dignity of Ayyub alayhi salam is a tribulation and a trial all by itself. And it could have been more painful than actually physical pain. It's to see his own wife suffering just to be able to feed him. And Ibn Kathir even mentioned that she worked as a servant in some houses, that she had to sell her hair so she can buy food and bring food to the table so she can take care of Ayyub alayhi salam. It was mentioned that was the uh, long braids of hair that she sell one at a time to to feed her her husband Ayyub alayhi salam. And you might imagine just the pain and the suffering that Ayyub alayhi salam was going through. Now, for some people who are not who are poor, it is very painful to be poor. But it's not as painful if they were rich before. Have mercy on a wealthy person that becomes poor. It's very painful. If they have tasted wealth and prosperity, and then to get to the status of poverty, it's much more painful. And it's much more hurtful than to be born into that. And those who've been sick, born sick, it is not, it is hard, it's extremely hard, but it's not as hard as people who tasted what it means to have strength and health. Those who never had any children, it's painful. But it's not as painful for people who had children and then lost them. So Ayyub was afflicted in the, in the hardest way possible because he had all of that and he had the best of all of that and then he lost all of it and then turned the other way turned 180 degrees to the negative part, that he had nothing and he was in, in constant pain. He was in constant physical pain and he was in constant emotional pain and his, he was, he was in constant pain just seeing his wife and his family going through what they have to get through. And then an event happened with his wife that made Ayub angry. And it is really not well known what made Ayyub angry at his wife. There is a lot of stories that you will see there. That one of them is that he was angry that she sold her hair without his permission. Uh, he was angry that she had to do certain jobs that he would not permit her to, to do. And there is one narration that just seeking remedy for Ayyub alayhi salam she went to a person that would give this cure through other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Iblis was in that 
role. Iblis was in, impostering in that particular role to, to sway her from Tawheed. And that is one narration that is, that is out there. Allahu A'lam. But she did something that Ayyub alayhi salam and his sickness and his pain, he got irritated with his wife and he swore that he will hit her a hundred times when his health is back to him. And the days went on. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Ayyub. That Finally, it got to the point that his wife, and many said it was the moment that he saw the head of his wife without hair, and many said that it was that moment when he lashed at his wife, and he felt that, he felt fear, that if his affliction continued, that she would be lost, that she would be swerved from the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That at that point, Ayyub turned to Allah and he said, Anni masani abdur wa anta arhamur rahimi. That was the entire dua of Ayyub alayhi salam. And it's what a beautiful dua to learn from Ayyub. What did he say? He said, Anni masani abdur. I have been touched. I have been afflicted by harm. I was seized by distress. Abdur. Dur, it's anything that is harm, harmful or painful. So he said, this is my condition, and you see it. And then here is your condition, Ya Allah. And you are the most merciful of anyone that would give me mercy. And in that, it is, it's absolute tawheed. He said, I'm not going to anyone but you. And then he did not ask Allah for any particular thing. He didn't say, oh Allah, give me back my money. Oh Allah, give me back my wealth. Oh Allah, give me back my family. Oh Allah, give me back my health. Oh Allah, just relieve the pain from me. He just said, you are the most merciful. My condition is as you see, and your condition is as I know. You know what's happening to me, and I know who you are, and that's enough. And that is better dua than anything he could have done. He could have said, oh Allah, just relieve my pain. He would have gotten that. Right? He would have said, just give me my family back, or give me my wealth back. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he is being called upon his mercy, he doesn't only give back what he has taken from Ayyub, he said, فَكَشَفْنَ مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرْ The first thing that happened is, anything that afflicted Ayyub was taken away from him. Was completely cured. وَأَتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ And then we gave him back his family and the like of their, their, their off. Just twice as, twice as much as he has lost was given back to Ayyub alayhi salam. So it's always better to leave it to Allah what he wants to give us. Right? Invoke his mercy. Invoke your iman. Invoke your condition upon him. And we have to call to Allah in humbleness and humility. Really have to have, if we are to have a broken heart before anyone, we have it before Allah. Remember Yaqub alayhi salam in Surah Yusuf? إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ He said, I'm not complaining to you, I complain only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to show Allah our humility is, is the right thing to do. But don't show it to anyone else. And if you are to ask, ask Allah. If you are to seek help, seek it only from Allah. And that's the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ You only ask Allah and you only seek help from Allah. And this is what Ayyub did. And Allah said, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ Immediately. Between the word Ar-Rahman, Ar-Arhamu Ar-Rahimin, Ar-Rahim, وَاسْتَجَبْنَا immediately, just completely. Allah said, here it is. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرْ وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا Mercy from us. وَذِكْرَى لِلْعَابِدِينَ And a reminder for the worshippers. What is Allah saying in this, in this verse is it is for you to understand. You worshippers, 
throughout time, came to, to, to when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inherits this world, is whenever you have an affliction, turns to, to Allah. You turn to Allah, and Allah will, will answer that. And Allah will lift that calamity. And how did it happen? Allah, you, and then this is the, the other verse. This is in Surah Sa'd. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ The same idea. He turned to Allah and he said, أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ That a shaitan has touched me with distress and torment. He didn't say, you have afflicted me. He said, a shaitan have afflicted me. And the ulama reflected on that. He said, what is a you... What does Ayyub mean? And there are two, two different uh, interpretations. The first one is what you can see in Tabari and Ibn Kathir, that a shaitan actually caused that harm to Ayyub. He, a shaitan was able to get into Ayyub and cause bodily harm and, well, and harm to his wealth. And the second interpretation of that that a shaitan started giving whispering around Ayyub to the friends of Ayyub and to the wife of Ayyub is see what Allah is doing to his servants see what Allah if Allah loves Ayyub he would not have done that to him so Ayyub started her Ayyub being hurt by those words because people started doubting the faith of Ayyub Shaitan started saying, if Ayyub was truly faithful, Allah would not have done that to him. If Ayyub was a, really a sincere servant of Allah, Allah would not have afflicted him. And we know that that's not true. Because the Prophet wasallam said, أَكْثَرُكُمْ بَلَاءَ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ The worst people that will be afflicted in this dunya are Al-Anbiya, are the Prophets of Allah. ثُمَّ الصَّالِحُونَ Then the righteous people. Then less and less and less. The more iman you have, the more test you're going to have. So this is what shaitan does to people. Trying to reverse that picture. He said, if Allah loves you, he would not have done that to you. And that's not true. We never ask Allah bala. We never ask Allah tribulation. But when it happens, we say, alhamdulillah. When the Prophet ﷺ was given the news that his grandson, son of Zainab, was dying, he said, you go back and you tell her, لِلَّهِ مَا أَعْطَى وَلِلَّهِ مَا أَخَذْ وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِمِقْدَارِ Tell her to Allah it's what he has given, and to Allah what he has taken. And everything is by measure with Allah. Allah knows what he's doing. And this is how, how a Muslim would face affliction. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ Everything is to Allah. Even us, we are to Allah. And we all, to Allah is the return. So a shaitan touched Ayyub with that affliction and he goes before Allah and he said, Anni masani shaytanu bin bin wa That the shaitan has touched me with torment and with affliction. And then Allah said, Irkud bi rijlik, hadha muftasanun baridun wa sharab. Strike the ground with your foot. This is a spring of water, wash out with it. It's a cool water that came out. And Allah said that that water will cure you. And even in that, there is this beautiful image that, yes, Allah can lift the calamity with two letters, B, kun. And it will be. But Allah wants you to do your part. He said, kick the ground, get water out, wash yourself. Do all of that and Allah will lift the calamity from you. So seek help. Meaning, seek help from Allah, but help yourself. Have tawakkul on, upon Allah, rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but do your part. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, that if you have true tawakkul upon Allah, you would be like the birds. تَغْدُوا خِمَاصَ وَتَرُوحُ بِطَانَ the, the hadith said that the birds that leave the nest hungry with empty stomach, but they come back to their nest and feel filled with, with food. This bitana, meaning the, the bellies are filled with food. But the key point here 
is the birds are leaving the nest. They're flying out, they're searching for food, and Allah is providing. This is the true tawakkul. The true tawakkul is you do your part and Allah will guarantee your risk. وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There's not anything, nothing alive on the face of the earth unless Allah has guaranteed their risk, their sustenance. But we have to do our part. So even when the cure comes to Ayyub alayhi salam, it didn't just boom, happen. And Allah is more than able to do that. But he said, strike the ground. Get the water out. Wash yourself. Drink out of that water and wash yourself with it. And the cure would come from Allah. And then Allah said, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلًا And we have given back his family as a gift, like hiba from Allah. وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنَّا And Allah doubled what he had before. رَحْمَةً Mercy from Allah. وَذِكْرَى لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ and a remembrance for those who heed, those who contemplate on that story of Ayyub alayhi salam. And then there is that one thing that is left to do. Ayyub has made an oath that he will strike his wife. But now everything is back. And one of the stories that is narrated in Ibn Kathir is when his wife came back to the house, she was scared that she saw this handsome man in, his, in her house this healthy gentleman. And she couldn't recognize him, knowing that her husband was so sick and had all these ulcers on his body and all of that. And she was scared of him until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him, brought him back and, and, and calmed her down. And she also had her youth back and had her health back. And that's how she doubled her family for Ayyub alayhi salam. But now there is this issue that Ayyub made an oath that he has to fulfill. And here's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, gives him a way out. Allah said, خُذْ بِيَدِكَ ضِغْثًا Take a bundle of ضِغْث, أَبْغَاثْ وَأَحْلَامْ Remember that word in the story of Yusuf. ضِغْث is something that is, it's a group of things that, that is weak and sort of irregular. So when you take a ضِغْث, it's a group of really very, uh, weak uh, leaves of grass. It's like long straw. Something that is just not, doesn't have that, that body to it. Something that is, doesn't have the strong substance. That's when, when uh, the people of the, the, uh, the, uh, around the king of Egypt, they said, Adghatu Ahlam has no substance. Right? Has no strength. And Adghat is that straw that doesn't have much substance to it. You can just break it very easily. It doesn't have that much strength. So Allah said, take a bundle, a hundred of those, wadribbi. He said, I will strike you a hundred times. And then Allah said, just take this one hundred and strike her one time so she was stricken with a hundred of those. And do that, wala tahnas, and fulfill your oath. And do not break your oath. Why Allah has found him a way out of this? Inna wajadnahu sabira. Because he, be, he was a truly a sabir. Ni'mal abd. What an excellent slave to Allah. Innahu awab. He repented to Allah. And, and from that verse you also understand that he regretted and repented saying that oath. Saying what he said in a moment of awkwardness, in a moment of weakness that he wanted to strike his wife a hundred times, and he wanted a way out of this. Now this opened a door for something that is really important for us to understand. And the fuqaha and the ulama, and even Ibn Kathir in the book of Qasas the Anbiya commented on this a lot, and that is the issue of al-hila shar'iyya. The issue of what is called as the shar'i sharia hila trick. It's people that do something in the sharia, and they find a loophole to finding a loophole in the jurisprudence to achieve a certain goal. And this was, according to a lot of ulama, this was Allah found a loophole for 
Ayyub alayhi salam, Ayyub, to actually fulfill what he, he said, he should strike his wife a hundred times in the day. Huge punishment. Probably she did not deserve. And Allah found him a way out of this. Many of the ulama said that that is the only way that you can use such a loophole if, you, if they are present. And an example of that is really a beautiful and funny story that Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa uh, and Nu'man was involved in it during the time of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. Abu Ja'far al-Mansur was the Khalifa, was the Abbasid Khalifa, and he was mad at his wife one time. And out of his absolute fury and anger, he told her that she is divorced unless she does not sleep in his kingdom tonight. He said, Anti taliqun in butti fi milki layla. You are divorced if you sleep in my dominion tonight. For his dominion was from China to Spain. <laughs> she was in Baghdad. There's no way that in 24 hours, they didn't have jumbo jets, right? That she can get out of his dominion. And then he regretted. He knew he did something wrong. So they called upon Abu Hanifa. They said, he said, I want a way out. And Abu Hanifa said, that's easy. So he said, get your clothes, get your stuff, and come with Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa takes her to the masjid. He said, this masjid is for Allah, it's not part of your kingdom. He said, this is not your dominion. The masjid, he said, she, he told her, you sleep in the masjid tonight, and tomorrow back you go back to your husband, and you're not, you're, that, that uh, Yameen was not... You, you did not hen, you may, did not make hence, you did not break your vow. Because she did not sleep in your dominion, she slept in the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ulama said that, that, that these are things, is to get believers out of trouble when they get themselves into it, if it is feasible, then the fuqaha, only the fuqaha now, only the people of knowledge are allowed to work within those rules. But don't, it's not us, it's not for the common people to, to have those hiyal, those tricks upon sharia, because that's a very dangerous territory. But, but the bottom line is that this particular incident is how the fuqaha base their knowledge upon, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds a way out for Ayyub, and Allah gives us a way to find a way out for the believers if they get into some awkwardness, of something that, that they should not be in in the first place. It's not of maqasid sharia, it's not of the goals of jurisprudence to be in. And it is also the one hadith that that, stri- that uh, really stands out is in the in the Sahih al Bukhari on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu an. بينما أيوب أيوب يغتسل عريانا when Ayub was naked and he was washing himself with that water that Allah subhanahu wa taala ordered him to strike out of the earth. خر عليه رجل جراد من ذهب a cloud or 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 a herd or a a flock of locust of gold came upon Ayyub alayhi salam. So he started accumulating that gold in his garment. Didn't I enrich you? Did I not give you? So you don't have to really gather that gold in, in your garment. And then he said, Bala ya Rabbi, yes, O Allah, walakin la ghinali an barakatik. But I cannot have enough of the blessing. What you are sending me is a barakah, is a blessing. And I know what you have sent me is not going to go away. The word, does anybody know the word barakah? What does barakah mean? Barakah, as a verb, means to settle down and to sit. When the camel sits there and stays there, you say the barakah al jamal. The, the camel sits and stays. And the wealth that comes and goes fast has no barakah. Things that come and go don't have any barakah in it, meaning it doesn't stay, you don't benefit from it. And the food that doesn't benefit the body has no barakah. But the things that, that stays and benefit, and the, and the benefit of it stays for a long time, that is what barakah means. That's the actual meaning of, the linguistic meaning of the word barakah. So he said, I know that that gold, لا أسلاغنا لي عن barakatik. I have, I, I cannot have enough of this barakah. 
Because whatever I'm having now, that's not going to go away. That is coming directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ulama also take a lot of ruling from this one hadith. And one of them is, there was a question, is can somebody go to the bath, go to the, to the shower and shower off naked? Can you take your clothes off in the shower? And actually this hadith gave the ulama the answer is Ayyub was washing out naked. It's in the hadith said, When he took his clothes off and he was showering himself and washing himself with that water that Allah ordered him to get out. So, you know, a lot of hadith that we read very fast, but the, the experienced eye or, and the mind of a jurisprudence expert, they know how to extract a lot of ruling for us. So, it is... From the hadith in the Bukhari, we know that the, the, the wealth that came back to Ayyub was an actual, literally, a, a shower of gold that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him after he obeyed the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now let's reflect on the very important issues of al-bala and al sabr these are the two lessons, or the two main ideas in the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. Affliction, and how we respond to affliction. What types of affliction we face in our lives, on what levels, and then how do we re respond, how do we react to these afflictions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ankabut says, A'udhu billahi min shaytan al-rajim, Alif Lam Mim أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين Allah said do people think that they will be just left to say that we believe and they are not tested indeed we have tested those who are before them Ayub was tested Yaqub was tested Yusuf was tested Ibrahim was tested Lut was tested. Salih, Hud, Nuh, certainly Adam. Allah said everyone has been tested. And the example that you see the prophets are being tested. And they have received afflictions from multiple kinds. Like Dawood and Sulaiman, they were afflicted by wealth and prosperity and power. And Ayyub was afflicted by what you see, lack of health, lack of power, lack of money ruining his family. So this is the sunnah of Allah, that everyone will be afflicted. We all going to be tested. This is what life is all about. And it can be on an individual level. We will be personally tested. And it can be on a family level. And it can be on a community level. And it can be on the whole society. And then it can be on the entire ummah. And sometimes you look around and you can see the entire ummah is being tested. And people are being tested in the depth of their faith. People are being tested. They say, I mean, some people, I'll lie, I have this. People come to me and said, why is this happening to us? Are we on the right path? Is this the true religion or not? Why is this happening to us? And we see how Ayyub, in the story of Ayyub, Shaytan would come to people and he'd say, see if, if Ayyub was correct, he, that would not have happened to him. If Ayyub was on the right path, he should not have been afflicted. And Allah says otherwise. He said, you're all going to be afflicted. And affliction is a sign of faith, and it is a test of faith. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى نَعْلَمَ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَنَبْلُوَ أَخْبَارَكُمْ we will test you so we know who strives and who is patient. And how are you going to deal with it? Akhbarakum. How do you react to that test? أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَنْ تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Do you think you're going to just walk into paradise? You're going to just walk into paradise? Just like this. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَزُلْزِلُ They were touched by ba'sa, by hardship, and dara, and harm. وَزُلْزِلُ And they were shaken. 
test of Allah is not easy because the, the reward is not cheap. The reward of Allah is very precious. So you think you can, I mean, do you, do you experience, you, you know, you, 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 you think that you want to just walk into a car dealership and walk out with a, with a Rolls Royce and just pay $5 for it? It doesn't work like that. So if we want to walk out with Jannah, we have to pay the price sometimes. And Allah chooses what He wants to afflict us with. Allah chooses the test for, for us. We don't ask for the test, and we don't choose the test for ourselves. وَزُلْزِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ Allah said that the shaking and the, and the hardship gets to the point that even the prophet and the believer would say, when is the victory coming? And then Allah answers, أَلَا إِنَّ نَصْرَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ Indeed, the victory, the support, the help of Allah is close. Just have patience. The word fitna, al fatan is a goldsmith. If you go to the linguistic root of the word fitna, fatan is a goldsmith. It's someone that takes the ores and the gold dust and gets pure gold out of it. And to do that, what do they do? They put it through the fire. They heat it up. And through the fire, the good metal comes out, and a zabad or a jufa, or this, the dirt is washed out. And that's what fitna is. Fitna is hard. It's like going through the fire. It is a test. But what comes out of it is pure gold. And that's the actual meaning, the linguistic meaning. And in every word in that you see in the Quran, there is a root for it, why it's exactly used. And sometimes you can have two words that are really close in the, in the actual Arabic meaning of it. Like the two words, ghafara and kafara. What do they both mean? Ghafara and kafara both means to cover up. Satara wa ghatta. If you look in an Arabic dictionary, you find that ghafara, which to us means forgive, and kafara, of course, to disbelieve, both in the, in the root of the meaning of the word means to cover up, to cover something. Now why one is to forgive and the other one is to disbelieve? And it has to do with the, word, with the letter ghain. When you use the letter ghain in the Arabic language, and this is the work of a man, a scholar called Ibn Jinni, who goes into each letter in the Arabic language and tells us why each letter is used in that particular word. Not only why is each word is used in that position, but why each letter was used in that word. The, Lord, the, the, word, the letter ghain means that something disappears and goes away forever. Like ghara, ghaba. Something that goes, is gone. And when Allah takes the sin and covers it up, that sin is gone. When Allah makes maghfirah, when Allah covers up our sins, like our sins will never happen. That they were never there. It, they're gone and they're gone forever. But kafara is when something that takes the truth and they're trying to cover it up. There's nothing that can cover the truth. The truth always comes back up. The, the truth always, you cannot hide the truth. Even those who are kafar, who they try to cover up their innate nature, their truth that is within, that Allah created with them, it can never die out. But the sins when Allah make ghafran, they go away. So th I'm just trying to give an example of how important to really understand sometimes the roots of these words and understand how Allah uses every word in the Quran so precisely. And every letter, it's in its own position. And that's why the Quran is such a miracle. Just from that linguistic standpoint. So the fitna, to go back, I digressed a little bit, but the fitna is, this, is basically trials by fire. It's a hard trial to show your true element. To show our true nature before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says that, that calamity, it happens to everyone. It happens to the believer and it happens to the disbeliever. It happens to the righteous and it happens to the disobedient. 
Allah said, إِنْ يَمْسَسْكُمْ قَرْحٌ فَقَدْ مَسَّ الْقَوْمَ قَرْحٌ مُثْلُهُ When you are afflicted by that harm and by that calamity, then people are being uh, touched by also a similar calamity. وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ And such are the days are in turns among people. But when it comes to the, to the believer, it is to elevate. And when it comes to the disbeliever, it is to punish. It comes to test the believer and to elevate their status. And when it comes to the disbeliever, it comes So they can t- taste from the lesser punishment before they get the greater punishment. And the opposite is true. When Allah gives prosperity and wealth and gifts to the believers, it is a reward in this dunya. And when it comes to the disbeliever, it is istidraj. Right? When it comes to the believer, it is tawfiq. When wealth comes to the believer, Allah, Rasulullah said, نِعْمَ الْمَالُ الصَّالِحِ لِلرَّجُلِ الصَّالِحِ Good wealth for a good person. But wealth also comes to disbelievers, and that is istidraj. That is their, Allah said, وَنَمُدُّهُمْ We give them, فِي طُغْيَانِهِمْ In their transgression, يَعْمَهُونَ To increase their blindness, to drag them worse on that path, that they're taking the bad path of destruction, that they're setting themselves upon. And everyone will get tested. الصالحون الأنبياء like we said this is a, a hadith in Al-Bukhari narrated on the authority of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas that the, Sa'd asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said Ya Rasulullah ayyun nasi ashaddu bala who is the, of the people that is tested the hardest the Prophet said Al-Anbiya thumma al-Salihun thumma al-Amthal fal-Amthal the Prophets the righteous and then the less and the less yubtala ar-rajulu ala hasab dinah he said, everyone will be afflicted according to how much faith they have. So if his deen, his faith is hard and solid, then the test will be harder. But if his faith is soft and light, then the test will be light. Listen to this. And affliction and tribulation continues to be upon a believer until he walks on the face of the earth and he has no sins upon him. Allah lifts all the sins away from these things that we that we what have happened to us. And Ibn al Qayyim said that any affliction that happens in any calamity, a human being is one of four. They're one of four things that we go through when we are afflicted. Four res- basic responses. He said the first thing is maqamul ajiz. Maqamul shakwa wa sakhat. The first or the lowest of these is the station of complaining. Something happens to us, we start complaining. Faidahum yaj'aroon. You know, we start complaining. And why, why me? Why my family? Why my money? Why my car? You know, there were 20 cars on the highway. Why, got, why they got me? <laughs> why, why this and why that? You know, whining, right? And, and Ibn al-Qayyim said that's the worst response to any calamity. Is al-shakwa wa sakhat maqam al-ajiz. And he called it al-ajiz, meaning uh, things that are just useless. I mean, you complain and com- we complain and complain and complain, and what good is that going to do? It's not going to help anything. And it's just going to make, make things worse for us. And then he said, لا يفعله إلا أقل الناس عقلا ودينا. The people that have least intellect and least faith, that's what they do when, when something bad happens to them. They start complaining. And then he said there is a higher level, and that is مقام الصبر. Uh, and, and by the way, the complaining can be of in the heart. Just go from that, that worst response to any calamity. It's to complain and to have bitterness and resentment towards the calamity or towards what Allah has allowed to happen to us. To have resentment to the Creator is the worst thing that anyone can have. And Ibn Al-Qayyim and later on Ibn Uthaymin, they explained that. And they said, 
Allah said in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفِ فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اِطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ إِنْ قَلَبَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ That there's some people that worship Allah على حرف on an edge or on a fence. Right? Their faith is not strong. I said, إِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اِطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ As long as they are doing well, they're fine. Iman is good, Islam is great, everything is fine. He's having enough of everything. And then Allah said, وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ fitna." But when a fitna happens, when he is now being tested to show the true meaning of his iman, in qalab ala wajhi. That's when they fall up, down on their faces. خَسِرَ dunya wal akhirah. They lost dunya and akhirah. They lost this life and they lost the hereafter. Because the fitna happened to them and they're getting no reward out of it. So whatever affliction happened to them, they lost what's in this dunya and they cannot get rewarded for it in the akhirah because of their reaction to it. This, the higher reaction to this is to have patience and to endure the affliction. And that is a sabr. And we will go over that inshallah in more details. Because inshallah tonight we have a lot of time. The third level the higher level of that, even higher than sabr itself, or actually in many, many scholars put it within sabr, it is the beautiful sabr, sabrun jameel, you heard that word sabrun jameel, on the tongue of Ya'qub alayhi salam, sabr jameel has this content in it, there is no resentment to the, to the musibah, there is no resentment to Allah, there is actually contentment with what Allah, there is satisfaction, and yarda al-insanu bil musibah, to have rida, I accept completely what has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent my way. And the highest level, the, the best response to any musibah is a shukr. It's to actually show gratitude for the musibah. Now that's hard. That's not easy. To be afflicted with something, not to complain is a must. It's an obligation upon us. Not to resent it not to have resentment towards the destiny, which is something that we believe it is from Allah. It is a must, it's an obligation. To have patience is what we are recommended to do. A rida, to be satisfied with it, is a higher thing. Now to have gratitude is really a high station out there. That is something that's for us salihun. That is something that we ask Allah to be of the people that we can... We can live and understand. Umar radiallahu anhu said in this famous ethar, he said, مَا أُصِبْتُ بِبَلَاءَ إِلَّا كَانَ لِلَّهِ عَلَيَّ فِيهِ أَرْبَعُ أَرْبَعُ نِعَمْ He said, every time I'm afflicted with something, Allah has already have four bounties that I need to thank Him for. Everything bad that happens to me, I need to thank Allah for four things. To show gratitude for four things. He said, the first, أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُمْ فِي دِينِ that that affliction is not in my faith. That my iman is not afflicted by it. And you look at Ayyub alayhi salam. Now he was okay with all of this. But his heart was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as the heart is intact, as long as the affliction is not in deen, then everything is okay. Now that is a high station. And Umar said, first thing that I thank Allah for, that the nusibah, the disaster was not in my deen. And the thing, that it was not worse than what it was. And every, every calamity, no matter what it is, you can always think that it could have been worse. Everything could have been worse. And then he said, the third thing, that I was not deprived from being satisfied, satisfied with it, than being content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it. That is something I need to thank Allah for. And then he said, the fourth thing, that I wish, that I hope, that Allah would reward me for it. And for that reward, I thank Allah for it. Meaning that every calamity, I will get rewarded for it if I'm patient. So I need to thank Allah for those four things. Now, there are etiquettes. In bala. 
There are etiquettes how we face calamity. Now, this is the story of Ayub that endured calamity, and some scholars say for 70 years. It was not a month or two of hardship. All agree it was years upon years, and some went up from three to seven years, and some say 70 years of calamity and adversity. So what are the etiquettes of the believers in face of calamity? The first manners, the first thing of we, we face Allah with is total belief. It's total faith in the destiny in Qadha. Now, Al-Imanu bil Qadha, Khayrihi wa Sharrihi min Indillah. The good and the bad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an article of faith. If we don't believe in the destiny of Allah and the Qadha, Al Qadha wal Qadr, then, then our Iman is not complete. We cannot even call ourselves Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ بْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Allah in Surah Al-Hadid said that it has not been a calamity or a disaster. فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ Upon this earth or in yourselves. Meaning anything that happens to you or to your surroundings. Unless it has been written in a book. Before Allah created you or created the earth. Before Allah created the creation, this has been written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know the first thing that Allah created was the pen. And Allah said, iktub, write. And the pen wrote everything that happens, that will happen to the, to the end of time. And then Allah created. So he said, Allah said that it is important to know that faith in Allah, the faith in Al-Qadr, so what does that mean? Meaning, you, you cannot change anything. And you cannot say, if I just did this, it would not have happened. You know, people torment themselves. They drive themselves crazy with guilt and torture. He said, if I only did this and if I did not do this. What the Prophet ﷺ taught us to do? Say, Qaddar Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al. Say, Allah has ordained this and Allah does whatever he wants. Only if I took that son to the doctor a little bit earlier, only if I not gave him this, if I only did. Don't say if, if, or if, or if not, if, or, or if I did, or if I didn't. Khalas. What happened is the qadr of Allah. And that gives us the comfort in the heart, and it is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah said in التغابن, anything, any affliction, any calamity, it is by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is in control of it. And those who believe in Allah, Allah will give them the guidance to the truth. And Allah is all-knowing. Then, the other etiquette of a calamity is whenever we are afflicted with something we don't like, we have to go back and review ourselves. Muhasabat al nafs. We go back and let's review our actions. We don't resent or complain about why it happened to us, but we need to know if there is anything what we have done that we deserve the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah said, Whatever afflictions happen to you, بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ It is with what your hands have gained. Have gained. And he forgives a lot. So, it is important that when something happens, is to go back and, and, and review ourselves. أَوَلَمَّا أَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَدْ أَصَبْتُمْ مِثْلَيْهَا قُلْتُمْ أَنَّ هَذَا قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ when something happened to you, you say, why, why did that come from? Allah said, huwa min indi anfusikum. It is from within yourselves. So let's review our deeds, review ourselves when an affliction happens. And Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ And those who have taqwa, when they are afflicted with the touch of evil, like Ayyub alayhi salam, you see here what, what he said, أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصُبٍ وَعَذَابٍ That shaitan has touched me 
with that torment and harm. And Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقُوا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ When a shaytan touch you with torment, with harm, تَذَكَّرُوا اللَّهِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ You remember Allah. So reviewing ourselves is part of the manners and the etiquettes of, of facing any calamity. The third etiquette of a calamity, of a musibah, of dealing with the adversity in our lives, is not to despair, not to reach the point of depression and despair and reach the status of what is called as qunut in rahmatillah. Hopelessness from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, وَإِذَا أَثَقْنَا النَّاسَ رَحْمَةً فَرِحُوا بِهَا وَأَن تُصِبْهُمْ سَيِّئَةٌ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ إِذَا هُمْ يَقْنَطُونَ Allah said in Surah Al-Rum, when we let people taste the rahmah, the mercy, they are happy with it. But when something bad happens to them, for what they have done, وَأَن تُصِبْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ when a punishment comes from Allah for what their hands have already delivered, they reach the point of despair and losing hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we reviewed the story of Ya'qub alayhi salam, said, La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Never lose hope from the mercy of Allah. La yaqnatu min rahmatillah illa al qawm al fasiqun. Only al fasiq would lose hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can lose, lose hope with Ar-Rahman? Ar-Rahim, Al-Kareem, Al-Sami' Al-Ghafoor, Al-Basir. How can we lose hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we believe in the beautiful names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we have a true understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. It really negates Iman to lose hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the other manner and the most important manner in facing an adversity or a calamity is the, the khuluq of as-sabr, the manner of as-sabr. Now, Ayyub alayhi salam is known for his sabr. When, whenever you, you have to give an example for sabr, a role model for sabr, you say as patient as Ayyub. You know, somebody who is just to have the patience of Ayyub alayhi salam. Now that's what we need. Now we spoke about the calamity and how we face calamity, but the, the weapon that we take into our battle with calamity and adversity is as sabr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoined upon us to have sabr and praise those who have sabr. Ya ayuhalladheena amanu sabiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa attaqullah la'allakum tuflihun. Isbiru wa sabiru. Have sabr and exchange sabr, to strengthen each other to have sabr. Support each other for that sabr. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَرَابِطُوا And steadfast. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And have taqwa and fear Allah. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ That you might attain success. And when Luqman was admonishing his son, يَا بُنَيَّ أَمُرْ بِالْأَقِمِ الصَّلَادَ وَأَمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُور to have iqamat salah and to enjoin the good and prohibit the evil and have sabr. It is the weapon of every da'ya. It is the weapon of every person that wants to call for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna thalika min azmi al-umur. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as narrated by both al-Mukhari and Muslim, he said, وَمَا أُعْطِيَ أَحَدٌ عَطَاءً خَيْرًا وَأَوْسَعَ مِنَ الصَّبْرِ no one has ever been gifted anything that is better and more vast than a sabr. If you are giving sabr, you are ready to face everything. If Allah has bestowed sabr, sabr upon us, we are ready to face anything, inshallah, that comes our way. If we have true sabr, if we have mastered that khuluq of sabr, that manner of sabr, a calamity and an adversity, we'll face it with sabr. And also, prosperity and wealth need sabr. Sabr is not only for calamities and adversity. You know, there is a sabru ala al-makarih. 
there is to have sabr before calamity and you have to have sabr ala ta'a to have patience and endurance to obey Allah obedience of Allah needs sabr to have this perseverance in ta'a and we need to have sabr an al ma'asi to, to, to have this perseverance in fighting the temptation of this world and the sins that are just lurking around. We know the hadith, حُفَّتِ الْجَنَّةُ بِالْمَكَارِ وَحُفَّتِ النَّارُ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ Jannah is surrounded by things that are hard and difficult. Yeah, you have to fast, you have to lower the gaze, you have to pray, you have to get up in the morning. You know, these are things that are just not, you know, if your nafs is given the choice, it wouldn't do it on its own. Right? حُفَّتِ الْجَنَّةُ بِالْمَكَارِ وَحُفَّتِ النَّارُ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ And fire is, is surrounded by all of these temptations. You know? A little bit of this and a little bit of that. Wine, beautiful women, and, you know, music, and uh, partying, and living at large, and having this and having that. That leads to hellfire. And that needs sabr. You know, we have to teach our children and teach ourselves and remind each other, sabiru, sabiru, wa sabiru. That we need to kind of really steadfast and support each other. That really needs everyday struggle. You know, to lower our gazes, to, to know how to treat people, to know how to live a true, righteous Islamic living. Not to trying to gain, you know, sometimes temptation, we, we want wealth and we want a lot of it and we want it fast. And there's a lot of ways that, that wealth will offer itself to us that are not good. And we have to be patient and endure. That's true sabr. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا أُعْطِي أَحَدٌ عَطَاءٌ عَطَاءٌ خَيْرًا وَأَوْسَعْ مِنَ الصَّبْرِ If you are giving sabr, then you're ready to, ready to face all of that. Then you have the right weapon, the right tools to face all of these temptations and all of these makari, all of these bad things. And Allah said, you'll be able to face what Allah is going to send you through life. Because Allah said, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ That you will be tested with some fear. You will be threatened in your safety. You'll be threatened in your family. You'll be threatened in, in, in a lot of things. Mil khawf, you will fear. Waljur, and some famine, some lack of wealth. Wal anfus, some people will die, they will lose their lives. Wathamarat, and out of the fruit, out of the gainful things that we get in this dunya. But Allah said, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ But give the glad tidings to us, Sabirin. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ And but give the glad tidings for those who have sabr when they are afflicted with the musibah, they say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We are to Allah, and the return is to Him. أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ Those will have blessings and mercy from their Lord. وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to His Prophet, فَاصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُلُوا الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ Said to His Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, فَاصْبِرْ Have sabr. كَمَا صَبَرَ أُلُوا الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ Like the prophets of strong resolve has showed patience. Now we know who are the Ulu al-Azm. Ulu al-Azm are Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what distinguishes those prophets of strong resolve from others? Allah says, as-sabr. Why these five were chosen of all the prophets and the messengers that Allah has sent? فَاصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُوا الْعَزْمِ It is their sabr. That is it. Sabr is not an easy thing. It is, but when, when someone is mastering sabr, taking sabr, training themselves for sabr, the Prophet said there is nothing better than that. مَا أُعْطِيَ أَحَدٌ عَطَانَ أَوْسَعَ From sabr. 
There's nothing vast, there's nothing more vast and more important than sabr. And not every calamity that we see is necessarily has a bad end for us. Now sometimes we have to go through bad things, but we have to keep in our mind that there may be good in it that we cannot realize. Our wisdom is limited. Our vision is very limited. But Allah's wisdom is infinite. And Allah said, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah said, you might hate something and it's good for you. And you might love something and it's bad for you. And Allah knows and you don't know. So follow the, follow the guidelines and you will be fine. And follow the sabr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will be fine. And the Prophet said that you will be rewarded for that. عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلُّهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ إِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّاءُ شَكَرٍ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءُ صَبَرٍ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ The Prophet said, how wondrous is the affair of the Muslim. Everything is good. When he is hit by a, by, when he is given an, an, a, a, a prosperity or wealth or something good, he would show shukr, gratitude to Allah, and that will be good for them. And when he is hit by a calamity, he will have sabr, and that is good for him. And there are benefits of sabr. And there are benefits of bala. What good can be in a, in a calamity? What good can be in, in something like what Ayyub السلام, had to go through? The ulama said there is infinite good in many calamities that happen to us. If we can just see, if we can just heed, and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. The first benefit of any calamity, it immediately reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I can tell you from personal experience and from experience of many of my beloved brothers that when they are in a tight ship and a tight position, immediately you get closer to Allah. And that is a good sign of a believer. When you need to run to some, someone, Run to Allah. When you need to seek help with someone, seek it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, وَإِذَا نَعْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَعْرَضَ وَنَأَ بِجَانِبِهِ وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ فَذُو دُعَاءٍ عَرِيضٍ It's a human nature that we become heedless and more forgetful when we are doing really good, prosperous, wealthy. It's easy to forget a lot of things that we should be doing. But we are, when we are in trouble, فَذُو دُعَاءٍ عَرِيضٍ We have a lot of prayer, a lot of supplication, and a lot of remembrance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing, the other good thing that Allah gives us with this calamity, a calamity can be good for us because we, we have the shukr. Like Umar radiallahu anhu said, that for every calamity there are four things that I need to thank Allah for. And we, we have to thank Allah that he was not in our, in our faith. That our faith is intact, inshallah. And it is, could, could not, you know, it could have been worse. And we should seek the reward and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And the good thing in the calamity is there is lifting of, of our sins. Our sins will be forgiven because of our endurance and our patience in the face of a calamity. Remember that hadith that we, we narrated in a Bukhari that ما يزال البلاء بالعبد حتى يمشي على الأرض وما عليه خطيئة that Allah, you know, if Allah wants to purify somebody He keeps giving them those calamities and adversities and hard time until they walk on the face of the earth and they have no sins left for them. So when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah straight to paradise. And then of the good things that come with, with hard time and adversities is if you are used to do good things, if you are used to get up every night and pray qiyam, if you are used to fasting Monday and Thursday, and we get sick and we can't do it, the reward keeps coming for doing that deed. 
that the reward doesn't stop even if we are held from doing that by our adversities and calamities. Remember when we were studying the Islamic history, one of the scholars that were jailed in the time of the Mu'tazilites, every Friday he would make wudu and he would go to the gate of the prison, as if he's like going to Friday prayer, just so he can get the reward of it. And he would say, Allahumma shahad, oh Allah, see, I did my part. They won't let me get out of jail to come to the Jum'ah. He was in a state of calamity. It was a, it was a Hard time for many scholars. Many scholars lost their lives at that time. Tortured, beaten. Ahmed ibn Hanbal radiallahu anhu. But all the good deeds won't stop, won't cease in a time of a calamity that we are used to do in time of health and prosperity. That's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس. Take advantage of five before five. Right? حياتك قبل موتك. Your life before your death. صحتك قبل سقمك your health before your sickness فراغك قبل شغلك your time before you get real busy because life you know be, makes us more busy we can't do a lot of things شبابك قبل هرمك your youth before your elder you become old right so we have to always take advantage and, and teach ourselves good habits so if a calamity comes we continue to take the rewards of those good deeds Another good thing that comes out of bala, comes out of musibah, is really to, to correct ourselves. Sometimes we have some small transgressions or big transgressions, and some people have to be stopped. When Allah loves some people, and see that they're swerving in the wrong direction, Allah stops them with the calamity to bring them back to the right path for islah, for, for their own good. Allah said in this beautiful verse, وَلَوْ بَسَطَ اللَّهُ الرِّزْقَ لِعِبَادِهِ لَبَغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ If Allah stretch His bounties upon people on earth, لَبَغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ They will become transgressors. You know, money and power corrupts. That's a fact of life. And only those who Allah has bestowed His bounty upon they're going to get corrupted by money and power. You know, we, we, it's easy for us a lot of times to say this leader and that leader, how they corrupt. And, and many times, you know, you just, I don't know what I'm going to do if I was in their place. You know, money and power brings corruption. And that's why Imam Adil, a leader that is just, is one of the seven that Allah will shade in his shade on the day when there is no shade other than the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah said, you know, Ibn Adam, أَعْطَيْتُكَ مَا يَكْفِيكَ وَتَطْلُبُ مَا يُطْلِيكَ I have given you what's enough for you, but you asked me for things that will make you a tyrant, give you transgression upon others. So some of those calamities that happen to us is to really set us back on the right path. Sometimes we go just swinging right and left through life, and we forget who we are, and the more powerful we get, the harder we swing. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us a little slap. Say, stop. Go back. And one of the benefits of bala is at tamhis Is to, to the fitna, the idea of the fitna and bala and tribulation is to show the good from the bad. The righteous from the evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلِيَبْتَلِيَ اللَّهُ مَا فِي صُدُورِكُمْ وَلِيُمَحِّصَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ So Allah will test what's in your chest. يُمَحِّص is to really go into the details and just the, 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 to show, to extract what's in the hearts. وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ Allah is all-knowing of what's in there, what's in the chest and then what's in the صُدُور. And then of the fawa'id, of the benefits of al-bala, is the reward of al-bala. Is what we get rewarded in this dunya for patience, and in the akhirah for our sabr and our endurance before this bala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about those who have sabr, وَأُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُعْتَدُونَ They will get the salawat from Allah, the, the blessing. 
from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa rahma and the mercy from Allah wa ulaika hum al-muhtadun and they will be giving guidance so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of them innama yuwaffa as-sabirun ajrahum bi ghayri hisab that the sabirun will be given back their reward without with no account you know we you may you know pay 10 dollars you get 10 hasana as-sabr you get a countless there's no accounting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sabr jaza as-sabr the reward for sabr is not by num- it's not numbered bila hisab al-awza'i said yughrafu lahum gharfan just like you know you know sometimes you give people you count their money when you give them but for those sabirun you just kind of by the bushels you know you just throw it at them throw the blessing the charity upon them so this is ayyub alayhi salam this is the story of ayyub it's a very simple story just two places in the quran that is narrated like he's mentioned in four time, four four places but the story is short in only two surahs in al anbiya and in sad right but but you can really i mean we spent here about almost close to an hour and a half just speaking about the benefits of bala understanding calamity calamity to the believer is is a good thing so how many benefits in calamity and it's a reminder for for the believer to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la'allahum yarji'un Allah said that might come back Allah wants you to be back Allah doesn't want you to swerve away from his path and some people will be called back and they come back and some people need to be pulled back and sometimes people need to be beaten back but if Allah loves you he will bring you back and we ask to be of the ones that that Allah loves us and bring us back in the easiest way and this is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once was asked he was uh, and this is in sahih muslim and i will conclude with that uh, he was visiting a sick sahabi sick believer and then he said he looked at him and he saw that his situation was terrible that his sickness just got the best out of him and he left him in a miserable situation and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al kunta tad'u bi shay did you pray for something what were you praying allah and he said yes i used to pray allahumma ma kunta mu'aqibi bihi fi al-akhira fa'ajjilhu li fi dunya he said i used to pray oh allah whatever punishment you are going to give me in the akhira give it to me now in dunya and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said subhanallah he said la tutiqu you cannot tolerate this and he said don't you say allahumma atina fi dunya hasana وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Pray for Allah to give you good in this dunya and good in the akhirah and to shield you from the hellfire. Don't ask for the hellfire torment to be happening now. Just ask for forgiveness. أَسْأَلُكَ الْعَفْوَ وَالْعَافِيَةِ Ask forgiveness and ask healthy and ask health and ask safety before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with all of these benefits of bala, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-afwa wal-afiyya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us safety to guide us in the right path to keep us on the straight path allahumma rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an nar allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima 'allamtana wa zidna 'ilman wa fiqhan fid din ya rabbal 'alamin subhana rabbika rabbil 'izzati 'amma yasifun wa salamun 'alal mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil 'alamin